In just 30 minutes, you can have a complete restaurant quality chicken katsu dinner awaiting your consumption. And I'm gonna show you how. Now I don't usually time myself when I'm making dinner, but just to prove how quickly this can actually come together, I'm gonna set a timer for 30 minutes and leave it right here for all to see. And yes, I have gotten out all of my equipment and ingredients already. So if you think that's cheating, then fine. It's a 32 minute dinner, big whoop. If you've seen my last few videos on kitchen organization, you know that it really doesn't take me long to get everything out. Plus I'm also filming, which will slow things down a bit. So I think everything will even out. Anyways, we're gonna start by making the rice because that's what takes the longest. And once we get it started, it requires almost no maintenance. So I'm using jasmine rice here and I'm sure you all know how to make rice, but here's my preferred method. I'll combine one part rice, which I've already rinsed thoroughly to remove excess starch, with two and a quarter parts water, and just a pinch of salt to taste, all in an appropriately sized heavy saucepan. Then I'll bring that up to a boil over medium high heat, after which point I'll stir and reduce the heat to low, then cover the saucepan and let it simmer for 15 minutes. Then at that point, I'll remove it from the heat, still covered, and let it steam off of the heat for another 10 minutes. So as I'm waiting for my rice to come up to a boil, I'm getting started on my chicken. And by the way, if you're not familiar with chicken katsu, first of all, you're missing out, so you should definitely try it. But it's a Japanese dish, and it's essentially a chicken cutlet breaded in a panko breading and then fried. And it can be served in a ton of different ways, but today we're serving it over top of a simple rice bowl, along with a light and tangy slaw and a homemade tonkatsu sauce. So we'll start with some boneless, skinless chicken breasts, and here I've just got one, which weighs about a pound. And anytime I'm making chicken cutlets, I like to cut off the thinner, pointy-ish end first, and then I'll cut the remaining thicker piece in half horizontally, like so. This way I end up with three relatively equal-sized pieces, both in terms of the serving surface area and the thickness. But to make these into true cutlets, we need to pound them out to a precise thickness of a half inch, or exactly 1.27 centimeters. And to do that, I'm using my trusty meat pounding device. And oh, would you look at that, the rice is boiling. So let's just stir that and cover it, and then move it over to a low heat burner. Now back to the chicken. So now we're gonna season each side generously with salt and pepper, and of course, be sure to wash your hands after any time you touch the chicken. Then from there, we can move on to the breading. And this one is a three-parter. So first, you'll need your all-purpose flour, plus a pinch of salt, then two eggs beaten with two tablespoons spoons of water, plus a pinch of salt. Then your panko breadcrumbs, plus, you guessed it, a pinch of salt. Even though we already salted the chicken, I like to add a bit of salt in every stage of the process so that the dish will be seasoned throughout. But now you'll also wanna get your pan heating if you haven't already over about a medium heat and fill it with at least a half an inch of oil, or again, 1.27 centimeters. And we'll want the oil to reach about 350 degrees Fahrenheit or 180 degrees Celsius by the time we add the chicken to it. So from here, we'll just follow a pretty typical breading process. So we'll coat the chicken in our flour, shaking off any excess. Then our egg mixture, being sure to let it drip out completely, then coat it in our panko breadcrumbs. And finally, once the oil is ready, we'll just carefully place the chicken in. And if your oil is hot enough, it should sizzle right away. So it's always a good idea to test it out first with a smaller piece, just in case you need to adjust the stove temp. But from there, it should only take about two to three minutes on each side. And by the end, the breading should be a nice light golden brown color. And you may also wanna use an instant read thermometer to make sure the chicken is cooked through. I aim for a temperature between 155 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you're wondering why not 165, I recommend you check out my brining video where I explain that in more detail. But while we're waiting for the chicken to fry, we'll have just enough time to prepare our slaw. And this is super simple, so we'll just chop up about a quarter head of cabbage, then about a quarter to a half of a red onion, depending on how big it is, then combine those in a large bowl. And really, you can use any type of onion, so if you don't have red onion, there's no need to rush out and go get one. Now at this point, it's probably time to flip your chicken, and by now it should be a nice light golden brown. Oh no. As you can see, I had a bit of an issue here with my temperature control. This was actually my first time using this portable gas burner, so it probably wasn't the best idea to do it on camera. But either way, you get the idea. In this case, I think I actually could have prevented this by using more oil from the beginning, basically like something more akin to deep frying. And that would definitely help to achieve more even heating. So that's what I recommend that you do. Either way though, I made the chicken again the next day using my normal stove. And through the power of movie magic, I can show you what it's actually supposed to look like. Now, while the chicken finishes cooking, let's make our slaw dressing. So in a small bowl, whisk together about a quarter cup of mayonnaise, one tablespoon of rice wine vinegar, one tablespoon of soy sauce, two teaspoons of fresh lemon juice, one teaspoon of toasted sesame oil, and just a bit of garlic powder to taste. And of course, you can use fresh minced garlic, but I'm using garlic powder here just for the sake of saving time. Then from there, you can add extra salt as necessary, but keep in mind that you won't need much, if any, because there's already soy sauce in there. But then just toss the slaw and dressing together and set that aside for the time being as we finish up the rest of the meal. Now the chicken should be just about done frying, so once it is, place it onto a wire rack to rest for just a few minutes, during which time we can make the ever important tonkatsu sauce. And this is actually the easiest part. It's only four ingredients, and 
I got this particular recipe from justonecookbook.com, which is a great resource for Japanese recipes, by the way. But all it is is two tablespoons of ketchup combined with five teaspoons of Worcestershire sauce, one tablespoon of oyster sauce, and two teaspoons of sugar. Then I also like to thin out my sauce with just a bit of water so that I can drizzle it over the chicken. But you could also leave it as is and just dip the chicken into it if you prefer. And of course, you can scale this recipe, so feel free to make even more if you like. But at this point, everything is done. And I actually had a few minutes to spare, so I got a bit of cleaning in while I waited for the rice to finish up. So to your plate, add a heaping scoop of rice along with about an equal amount of slaw or less if you prefer, but personally, I like a pretty hefty portion of slaw. Then top it with your sliced chicken and finally drizzle with the tonkatsu sauce. And there you go. This is, in my opinion, one of the most delicious dinners you can make and you can get it done in less than 30 minutes. Now to see another method for achieving absolutely delicious tender chicken, be sure to check out this video right here where I discuss the power of brining along with some common misconceptions around internal cooking temperatures. Either way, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next one.